Hello and welcome back to the channel, it's Mark from PowerSonic and Apprentice 1 to 1. Today we're going to have a look at fitting some conduit onto this trunk in, just a couple of socket outlets. We're going to use the conduit bender, some 20mm steel tube and then some metal clad accessories as well. Now first up, I've got a little off cut here already um, from another job. So we're going to make use of this. It's a good length, it just needs making it into a straight piece and we've already got a threaded end. So that's going to live somewhere over here and we're just going to drop a socket outlet onto the end of that. So that's a fairly straightforward one. We need to cut this one off flush. So we can do that in a second as well. But we're going to add another second socket. And with this one, we're going to take a bend on it. So you can see I've got a longer length here. And we're going to install this at this side. And we're just going to swing a little bend across to put it a little bit nearer the edge there. Um, just so we've put a set in a bit of tube, really, I suppose. And... Um, trying to demonstrate some of the skills you might use in measure and marking up and then how to actually use the threading tool because um, for those of you who haven't done it before you may not know so we'll get into that as well in a second um, so yeah we'll start off nice and simple really and you can see i've got the the hillmore el25 shorty down here i've had this a long time it's been through a fair bit of service you can see we've got the 25 mil um, roller set down there, former sorry, and then the 20mm former here and a nice working base on the top. Um, you can use various methods of cutting your conduit. So you could use a hacksaw. Um, I've got the sawzall here. This is really good with a bi-torch blade in it just for rough cuts because obviously you're going to be reaming the ends and um, making them nice and safe. So it's whatever does it fastest. You can use a jigsaw as well, which I'm going to demonstrate in this case because people don't believe you can do it on tube, but you can. Um, and again, metal cutting blade on this one. PPE is important, so make sure you've got your gloves and glasses on. Nice high speed, the metal cutting blade, and you can actually use the vise as a, as a level so you get a nice straight cut, which is very, very handy when you're working with conduit. So I'll just show you how to do that now. See that went through nice and easy and we've got a really flush cut on the end so that's nice and flat ready for us to thread and get um, into this tube up here sorry this um, trunking up here so we can come to that in just a sec but we're going to thread a nice end onto this end um, couple it into our metal clad back box and then we're good to go so just bear with me one sec and i'll get that set up so you can see we're back into the um, vise now. I've pulled it through a little bit further because we're going to cast the thread onto this end first. So I've just reamed the sharp pieces off the inside. doesn't really matter too much because you're going to be using the threading tool anyway, but it's always best to make sure you've got a nice square end and there's no sharp bits sticking out on you. Again, you want some cutting compound, plenty of this, because it enables the tools to last a lot longer. So a nice liberal application of that onto the end. Your threading tool, you have your main base plate here. You then want to insert the right size um, tube holes. This is the 20mm fitting. That goes in the base there to protrude out of this end. So that's where the tube's going to insert. You then want to put your die on. And again, make sure you get the 20mm die with the right cutting thread in. There are variations. Uh, this is an F4P set, I think. Whoops. Yeah. This is an F4P set that I've had for quite a while. So I have got some older sets as well, but this one is in good nick. So we're going to use this to demonstrate um, on the channel. And so you put your arms in to each end as well. This allows you some leverage while you're working on the tube. And then finally, or you could put these on before the arms, I suppose. Doesn't really matter. Uh, the holders, and this just clamps the um, threading part of the tool into place so it's not moving around because you need to make sure that that's square and firmly held in position and I'll show you that a little bit closer up just so you can see what I'm talking about so if you look there there's the two grooves in this um, M20 threader and you want to make sure they line up with these clamps so it's all fixed firmly into position then you want to make sure you get a good application of some of the spray into here as well and set to with your threads it is as simple as that so you want to get it on there the first few are always the most difficult to get it going so you want to try and keep it square on the metal 
we don't want to go off on crazy angles just go slow to start with you'll feel it start to bite as it has done there and then you just want to back it in back it off a little bit and then it's just a slow process wind it in spin it back out a bit just to clear off the swarf and then go again some people spin more turns on before they back off than others some people do short amounts as long as you're cleaning out the muck as you go it enables the tool to last longer and you get a nice neat cut there are um, tools you can buy to do this so power tools and they are very very handy if you're doing lots of tube work it saves all the manual labor again just make sure it's cleaning out you've still got plenty of lube on there and roughly speaking you want to come to the back edge of the former so you know you've gone far enough with your cut because you want to make sure there's enough thread on there for when you go inside the box to get a good um, fitting on I'll show you that in just a second so you can see we've got a nice thread on there now I'm just going to drop this coupler over the end just to make sure that you know it's actually going to work before we get too far along uh, you simply twist that on it should go on pretty smooth because there's plenty of the cutting compound obviously still in there I've not wiped it off yet and that's gone on nice now obviously when you come to join into your metal clad back box you don't insert the threads well you can if you use the um, female lock nut I suppose on the inside of the box but it's best if you use a coupler on the top and put a brass um, nut into the end I'll show you that in a second and then you've got a good um, solid connection into the box and you're not going to catch any of the edges of your cable in as you come to uh, wire it out. Now there's various tips and hacks that people show on the internet for getting your holes in the trunking into the right place. It's really not that complicated. Um, if you've got an especially difficult one with loads of stuff in the way, your best bet is to use a measurement. So you can measure to the center of the hole off the back of the box. But if you've got good access like this, you can hold the box up and just mark it, which is what I'm gonna do right now. Okay, so you can see I've taken the middle knockout out. You just want to position this onto the wall and you know your tube's going to run straight up off the back of this. So you can simply draw around and there's a good circular mark there for you to make your cut. Now, some people have these boxes that they will use as their marking out tool. So if you take the top and bottom knockout out, you can put the pen all the way through to get a nice marking. You can put a little coupler on the top so you can get the pen up into the back box and through the coupler or you can use a sharp pen and pencil. There's loads of easy ways to set up little jigs to get your holes in the right place but this is straightforward for the minute. And like I say, if you hold this against the finished surface, you can measure to the middle of the box and then if you measure out that distance off the containment above, it's really difficult to go wrong to be honest. But yeah, there you go. So we'll get that hole cut. Okay, so I thought I'd demonstrate another tool you can use to cut your holes. You saw me using the Armeg um, cutter. This is just a cone cutter on this one. Achieves the same objective, but I hope we give it a while just to demonstrate it. So again, make sure you get on the center, spin the tool up. And run it through now the acid test is when you hold the box up to see if those holes line up with each other and they do so i'm happy with that that's going to give us a straight through connection so if we get our little tube wherever i misplaced it and there's already a couple are on this end i'm just going to get another one for this end and a couple of the nut inserts okay so I'll loose fit them first and just get that going so we've got a bite on there now and twist that in and we'll give all this a nip up in a second and I'll show you what tool we're going to use to do that we've got that end in there and then this end we'll just get this started because there is a much easier way to do this. So that's held loose now. I mean, you could screw the box to the wall first, of course, that would have made sense, but I thought we'd um, demonstrate this. 
this way. Uh, let me see if I can find the implement I'm looking for. Okay, so I've gone for this tool here. This is the Bush and Brocket set. So this is the 20 mil one. I've got a full size range of them over there, but they're really handy for when you're working inside containment. So you can see here, we can just nip that up really quickly. Easy as that. And we'll just nip that one up in the top as well. There we go. You can see um, that was testing my vertical challenges, getting up there to do it. But that's now, um, it's in, it's onto the trunk and it's all you're left to do really is secure that back to the wall. May as well do that now while we're at it. Right, so I'm just going to screw this back to the wall now. There's the big debate you might have seen or not seen online to do with panhead screws and counterhead screws. I'm using counterhead wood screws here because we've got this wooden backboard. I've just put some screw caps on so it stops any of the edges sticking out before anyone gets upset. So I just screw that back and we get a nice tight fix in. What's not to like? Okay, so that's the short little length done. Dead straightforward. Just make sure you get your threads in the couplers all the way down, that you're tightening everything up so it's nice and tight on the other containment and the metal clad back box. This is a Click Skullmore um, metal clad accessory. I'm using a few different brands just to give people experience of the different fittings and things that are out there and the way they all terminate. Uh, I thought as wider exposure to stuff as possible makes a lot of sense. So in this case, we've got the Click Skullmore and I'm gonna put all those on the single phase board and M2 accessories are gonna go on this three phase board. I don't know why I've decided to do that, I just have. But now we're going to put a little bend in. Now this one, I was just going to do a little set over there, but I thought we'll keep the, the length, you know, a reasonable distance, because the idea is this is going to be for people to come and practice pulling singles through, and just a sh little short daft length isn't that much of a challenge. So I thought if we go for something a bit longer, so I'm just going to mark here on the wall, that's roughly where I want the centre of my bend to be. Now you can use a tape measure and set that to the way you need your centre of your bend. Um, but in this case, we can just eye it in. Now, there is marks on this Hillmore former from years of use. So I know where I need to position the tube for the center of the bend. Now, but you can um, take measurements to help you form these bends. And again, if you go off and watch GSH, I'm not gonna do this as a suck eggs conduit bending class because Gary has done an absolutely incredible job with that. And also Mike from Residual Current have gone through this in great detail already, so I don't want to repeat the content that's out there. If you go and check their channels out, there's some incredible conduit tips and tricks. And I'm hoping to maybe get Mike to come down here and demonstrate some of that in one of these booths as well, um, because he resonates that to his audience in a far better way than I can. But yeah, just set a simple bend. I've got the marker there. I know that that's the center of the bend. I'm just gonna lean the former down onto it for the minute just so there's some tension there, just to hold the tube. So I use this little level from Klein, and you can use it to set an angle, as well as know what is level. So if I hold the zero, just to get it flashing. So you can see now it's zeroed off in that position. So if I was to move the tube, see me move that, it gives a, an angle. Now we need to zero it on this end, so make sure you've got it locked down tight. Um, we'll go through that process again, just because we're a little bit different over here. So you can see now it's going through the process of zeroing off, it's just trying to make sure it's got a level, and it should go to zero. Now we want to bend a 90 degree on the end of this, so you just start pushing basically. This is a bit difficult in the booth because I ain't got a lot of room. We'll give it a whirl. So I can see there up to 61 degrees, 89.6. I'm going to say, I'm going to call that as a 90. So we'll lift it out and have a look at it. Okay, now there's various ways you can check if you've got a 90, you can use a set square. You can use a square part of the room that you may know is already square. You can hold it up against a bit of distribution board and eye it in yourself. I can see that's pretty square. We hold it against the containment here. See, we've got a nice bend there. So once we finish this, if we come to set the level on that tube, it should give us a level to say that that is bang on. 
zero degrees, so we can check that. See, I popped the level up there on this trunk in that we know is level. Surprisingly, it's bang on 0.0, .0 so somebody who knows what they're doing must have done it, and not me. And if we just bang this on the, the tube here, and I'm very loosely going to hold it on and just see if we're something nearby to the correct angle. So you can see there, 0 0.3. So we want to be back there a touch. Now, I can't see from where I'm stood, but that looks to be pretty square on to me. So I'm happy we've formed a 90 degree bend on that. Now, if you was to go a little bit too far, and the thing I would advise when you're using the conduit bender is to practice on scrap material first and foremost, but always just push past the 90 little bits. It tends to spring back. And if you do go ever so slightly too far, you can always take a little bit out. It's where you go wrong is when you go far too far and then you end up squashing the join when you're pulling the bend back out. Um, you just want to kind of tweak around it a little bit. And obviously some of the stuff you're working with out on site isn't going to be exactly 90 degrees square. You know, some of the walls you'll be working with can be out, especially when you're doing sets. So it's all well and good teaching yourself how to do the 90 degree angles, um, E45s and such. But when you're out working in the real world, sometimes you've got to bend around stuff that isn't square. So knowing how you can make little tweaks and adjustments is a useful tool to have. So don't be afraid of overbending or slightly un underbending. It's when you start going past back and forwards and you can make a mess and all this will crease and crinkle and it doesn't look very good. Um, but yeah, let's get this other box on the wall now. And I um, need to thread both ends of this, so I'll quickly do that off camera. Now you've watched me do it once, there's no point watching again. Okay, so you can see we've got that on zero degrees there, so that's a good indication that our bend is right. We're horizontal on that plane. If we then check across here, you can see we're at 89.95. So it's, it's pretty close. That's just probably a bit of inaccuracy due to the saddles not being in place. There's a little bit of movement on there. So that's not a bad effort. Um, if I come around this side, you can see we've got it fairly square and perpendicular to this board. It looks like a nice even gap. So that's the thing when you're working around existing containment and other finished surfaces. Sometimes what's square and true can look most out of place when you're working with things that are already there. So it's well worth checking the angles of things. So we'll have a look at some angle, gauge, angle gauges and gauge finders in some future videos. So if you are working off a corner that's not square or you've got a bit of trunking that's already up and it doesn't look quite right and you want to match in with that rather than set something that is square because it's going to look better to the eye. And I'll show you how you can do that as well in some future videos. This is all set now for somebody to come along and drop their singles in down to this low level socket point. So you can get used to working on your knees with some knee pads or as Jamie Blayton says, sit on a box. And we've got this one over here that's at a nice height for somebody to come along and, and work their magic um, and wire this out as well. Hope you've enjoyed this video. If you've got any questions, do drop them in the comments below. I'm going to keep this coming as I build this up. This is just a couple of sockets. We're going to have some emergency lights in here. We're going to have some key switches. Um, we'll have some uh, motor controls as well. It's going to be built up into quite a decent booth. We'll try and get some uh, variable frequency drives and some motors involved as well. We are a little bit limited on space on this one. The booth next door is getting set up as the domestic area at the minute with some uh, prosumer is in built in and some smart home controls. We will add more as we go along as well. But obviously this is just fitting around the day job for the minute and um, it is what it is. It takes a bit of time. Like I said, I'm hoping to work with some other people through in, from throughout industry and set some of these demos up for people to come and enjoy. So I'm speaking to Eddie Clemens at the minute about some BMS panels that he might help us come and set up in one of these and talk through how you build one of those up and how they work, which would be incredible and let him demonstrate some methods of working with containment as well, because that's a big part of that job. And then, um, yeah, we'll just see how it goes. This one for the minute is what it is. We're all squaring on the wall. We can start with the last little few bits of trunking and containment. As I mentioned in the last video, we've got the power tag expansion board to go in. There's that as well. 
Uh, once I've got it to a reasonable stage, we'll start wiring and doing some second fixing, and then we can look at some testing. We'll take this right from start to finish, try and break it down into a series of videos. I want to look at the metering kit as well, for those of you who spied that there, so we can have a little play around with that too. And um, yeah, if you've got any ideas or you think there should be something else in here, shout out and let me know about it. And until the next time, I will see you then.